Yeah. You know we still at it. We are persistently telling the truth. Now, a lie is a murderer of the truth. Lies are murderers. All it takes is one lie to kill the truth. But I'm so thankful unto God that the truth never fails. It always comes to victory. That's just the truth. No matter how much you try to bury the truth, it still comes out. Even as the prophet Isa said, whatever is in the dark is going to come to the light. Now, the majority of New Testament scholars also agree that the Gospels do not contain eyewitness accounts, but that they present the theologies of their communities rather than the testimony of eyewitnesses. So the Gospels are not eyewitness accounts. Now, many of my brothers, they don't even know that the Gospels are not written by eyewitnesses. But they were fictitious names, pseudonyms, that was made up. So Mark wasn't written by Mark. That was a made-up name. And so forth with Matthew, Luke, and John in the chronological order. John being the last gospel. No wonder Mark, Matthew, and Luke is not expected explicitly dealing with the divinity of Jesus. But when you get to the last gospel, John, John is literally making it seem as if Jesus is God in the flesh. It didn't start off that way. Jesus went from being the Messiah to being God, okay? And that's what happens. Just think of someone when they pass away. Many people put extra cream on a taco and they say, oh, that person was just the sweetest soul. There's always lies affiliated with death. People simply exaggerate. Now, new research claims that the Gospel of John is an ancient forgery. It is poised to overturn much of what we know about everyone's favorite biography of Jesus. So let's let's do a quick recap real quick. The four Gospels are all made up witnesses. They are not eyewitnesses. Also, John being the last gospel. New research. Now, many people believe it was a forgery. Now, also, I want to ask you a question. If the gospel of John was not written by the apostle John and the gospel writers are all anonymous, who are you going to believe? Are you going to believe what God spoke to Moses and the prophets? Or are you going to believe John? Are you going to believe the prophet Moses, whom God spoke face to face with? Whom God wrote his book with his own finger. Speaking of Moses, Moses did not write the law. It was God Almighty who wrote the law with his very own finger. Are you going to believe that account? Or are you going to believe unknown authors, such as the author of Hebrews, the authors of 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, the New Testament, in other words? Who are you going to believe? Are you going to believe Moses and the prophets? Or are you going to believe 
some anonymous gospel writers. Now in Exodus 31 and 18, it reads, And he gave unto Moses when he had made an end of communing with him upon Mount Sinai, two tablets of testimony, tables of stone, written with the finger of God. Let's get another scripture. Deuteronomy 9 and 10. I do not like doing scriptures where it's just one reference. Okay? Such as, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. That is seen nowhere in the Old Testament. Nowhere. And from no one but your boy John. Wants to say, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. That is one reference. So my second reference to God writing the law with his very own finger is going to be Deuteronomy 9 and 10. And the Lord delivered unto me two tables of stone written with the finger of God. And on them was written according to all the words which the Lord spake with you in the mount out of the midst of the fire in the day of the assembly. So God spoke to Moses face to face. God wrote the first book with his very own finger. And there's another reference. Let me get another one for you. This is going to be in the book of Nehemiah. You have me all to yourself tonight. This is the exhortation of May 13. And I am excited because I have some solid scriptures for you. For those who love the word of God. Right here in Nehemiah chapter 9 verse 13. Thou camest down also upon Mount Sinai, and spakest with them from heaven, and gavest them right judgments and true laws, good statutes and commandments, and madest known unto them thy holy Sabbath, and commandest them precepts, statutes, and laws by the hand of Moses thy servant. It was God Almighty who gave us the book. He wrote it with his own finger. Now, who are you going to believe? In the book of Hebrews, it's practically saying God is a man. Let's get that real quick. This is going to be Hebrews chapter 1. Let's go to verse 8. But unto the Son, he saith, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. So what you're saying is God Almighty is calling Jesus God? If you go to the book of John, it reads, John 1 and 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. Let's go to the meat of the scripture, verse 14. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. That's all we need right there. So basically you're saying God came down here and became a human being. What reference you have? Okay, this right here is where you're going to have to make the decision. Are you going to believe God, what he spoke to Moses, or are you going to believe John, who is anonymous, and the book of Hebrews, its author is unknown. This is an unknown author. Nobody knows who wrote the book of Hebrews. Okay? It is said that Paul wrote it, but the author... Is unknown. Now let's go to what the Bible says. Let's start off with the book of Numbers, chapter 23 and 19. God is not a man that he should lie, 
neither the Son of Man, that he should repent. Have he said, and shall he not do it? Or have he spoken, and shall he not make it good? So God is basically saying, he is not a man, and he is not a liar. So if God is not a man, he's a God of truth. But if God is a man, he's a God that lies. Now, according to the book of Moses, God is not a man. And he's not lying because he said, neither the son of man that he should repent. In other words, God is not a man and he's not going to lie about that and be a man later. God is not a man. Let's get 1 Samuel 15 and 29. And also, the strength of Israel will not lie nor repent, for he is not a man that he should repent. This is a perfect precept for Numbers 23, 19, because it's saying the same thing. God is not a man, and God is not about to be a man in the future. He's not going to change that, okay? He's not going to be a God and then be a man. God is not a man. Now, this is Samuel. Samuel said this, and in the book of Samuel, I'm going to get this real quick because a lot of people don't know these scriptures, and sometimes I just assume People have read the Bible. That's just how my mind works. So I'm going to get a scripture that is going to prove that nothing the prophet Samuel, peace be upon him, ever said touched the ground. This is going to be 1 Samuel 3 and 19. And Samuel grew, and the Lord was with him, and did not let none of his words fall to the ground. So in other words, Everything this man said was the truth. And he said that God is not a man. Moses said from God's very own finger that God is not a man. Let's get another scripture because I have more references. This is going to be Hosea 11 and 9. I will not execute the fierceness of mine anger. I will not return to destroy Ephraim, for I am God and not man. Pause. God is not a man. And most people don't understand what he is saying. So I'm going to break it down. I will not execute the fierceness of mine anger. I will not destroy Ephraim. That's the northern kingdom. For I am God and not man. In other words... God is not going to destroy Ephraim because he is a God of mercy. He always gives the sons a chance to repent. God is not going to destroy the sons based on what the fathers have done. God tells us in Deuteronomy 24, 16, that he will not judge the sons based on what the fathers do, and he will not judge the fathers based on what the sons do. Every man is going to die for their own sins. Now, that's the God of the Bible. He's been saying that since Deuteronomy. He's been saying it in Chronicles. He's been saying it in Kings. He's been saying it in Ezekiel. He's been saying it in Jeremiah. He's been saying it in the last book before the New Testament, Malachi. That God is a God that is going to judge the fathers based on what the fathers do. God is going to judge the sons based on what the sons do. Every man is going to die for their own sins. So when God is saying that he is not a man, he's trying to tell you that he is not going to punish the fathers based on what the children have done, nor is he going to punish the children based on what the fathers have done. Why? Because God is not a man. Only men think like that. 
Okay? That's the kind of thinking you have in Christianity. Where they say the son has died for the father's sins. Okay? Which originated in Ezekiel 18.19. I'm going to go there. Because I can't assume that you know this scripture. This is going to be Ezekiel chapter 18 verse 19. Yet you say, man say, why doth not the son bear the sin of the father? That's not God's way. That's man's way. This is what man was saying. God says, when the son have done that which is lawful and right, and have kept all my statutes, and have done them, he shall live. In other words, God is not going to punish the fathers based on what the sons have done, nor is he going to punish the sons based on what the fathers have done. Verse 20, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. The son shall not bear or carry the sins of the father, neither shall the father bear the sins or carry the sins of the son. The righteousness of the righteous, the good works, shall be upon the righteous. And the wickedness or the wicked works shall be upon the wicked. This is God's way. If you're wicked, you're going to die. If you're righteous, you're going to live. I'm not about to make anybody pay for your sins. That's what you call counterfeit Christianity. And the Pharisees made that religion. And that Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee, is Paul, the wolf in sheep clothing. Now let's get back to some more references of God not being a man. This is going to be Judah chapter 8. Verse 16, do not bind the counsels of the Lord our God, for God is not a man. Let's say that one more time. For God is not a man, that he should be threatened. And then look what it says. Neither is he as the son of man, that he should be wavering. So God keeps telling you, that he is not a man, nor is he the son of man. Now, Jesus was called the son of man more than anybody. He was called the son of man more than Ezekiel. And Ezekiel was called the son of man 82 times. Jesus was called the son of man, either by himself or others, more than 93 times in the New Testament. So God is simply saying, I'm not a man. And I'm not the son of man. I'm not a man. And I'm not the son of man. I'm not a man. Nor am I the son of man. Well what the hell is going on in the New Testament? Forgery is taking place. Lies. Which are murderers. Of the truth. That's what's going on in the New Testament. And our people. They're so weak. They're so lost. They would rather believe John, who is anonymous, more than they would believe Moses, more than they would believe Hosea, more than they would believe the prophet Samuel, more than they believe Judith, who is in the Apocrypha. She also said that God is not a man. God is not the son of man. Now, I'm not twisting any of what. I'm bringing out Christians always twist and they always want to tell you what something means. Notice I'm dealing with the scriptures directly. The Bible says God is not a man. Do you understand that? Can you comprehend that? There's no way for me to try to tell you what that means. Okay, this is not Christianity. I'm not going to be trying to tell you what stuff means. I'm just going to tell you what it actually says. And it actually says that God is not a man. Now let's go to Isaiah 31 and 3. Now the Egyptians are men and not God. Hold up. The Egyptians are men and not God. 
Now, this is a contradiction if you're saying Jesus is God. That's what it is. But I disagree. The Egyptians are men and not God. And their horses flesh and not spirit. When the Lord shall stretch out his hand, both he that help of shall fall, and he that is hoping or helped shall fall down and they all shall fail together. In other words, God is saying only men die. Only men die. Gods do not die. Now let's go to Ezekiel 28 and 9. Will you say before him that kills you I am God? But you shall be a man and no God. In the hand of him that kills you. In other words, only men die. You can't sit up there and say that you are God if someone kills you. That don't make no sense. Now, the pharaohs of yesteryear, yesterday, however you put it, they thought they were God. That's why Pharaoh did not want to listen to the Most High. He did not want to listen to Moses. Why? Because he was God in his own mind. He was not about to listen to nobody else. All his life, he's been taught and trained to be God from his ancestors. The Pharaoh literally thought he was God in the flesh. Okay? So when God showed up on the scene and he did his wonders through Moses and Aaron, and then his final plague, he killed the firstborn, which is a picture of what's going to happen to Prophet Isa. You call him Jesus in the future. God is going to kill the firstborn. He's going to close Jesus' eyes. Getting back, the reason why Pharaoh did not want to listen to the Most High is because he thought he was God. And God got the most glory. When he destroyed Pharaoh's firstborn son. And it's the exact same thing that is going to happen in the future. God is going to get the most glory when he causes the prophet Esau, peace be upon him, to die. And it's so sad because it's all Paul's fault. Paul was the one who made Jesus a god. Okay, he made him the god of Egypt. Okay, and God Almighty is going to destroy that lie in the future. And that's why I love the Quran, because the Quran deals with that issue. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even asked Jesus, did you tell the people to worship you and your mom as gods? And Jesus will deny those charges. And even in your own Bible, there's not one scripture that tells you that Jesus said to worship him. That's all assumption. Christians love assuming. It's because they have no ground to stand on. The ground has swallowed up the sons of Korah. And they have no legs to stand on. All they have is conjecture. For neither did they kill him or crucify him. For Allah took him. They certainly did not kill him. Getting back, we have more, more references. Let's get Ecclesiasticus 4 and 22. Accept no person against your soul. And let not the reverence of any man cause you to fall. In other words, don't reverence a man to the point that he's going to make you fall. In other words, don't worship a man. This is right here in the book of wisdom. It's telling you not to accept any man to the point that is going to cause you to fall. And that's exactly what they did to Jesus. They took Jesus and they made him a God. And now Jesus is the stumbling stone. He is the stumbling stone. Many people are falling. Let's get that scripture. This is going to be Isaiah Chapter 8, because I like to verify everything I'm bringing out with the scripture. This is going to be Isaiah chapter 8. And let's go to verse, let's go to verse 13. Sanctify the Lord of hosts himself. 
and let him be your fear and let him be your dread. In other words, only fear God, only worship God. Verse 14, and he shall be for a sanctuary, but for a stone of stumbling and for a rock of offense to both the houses of Israel for a gin, that's a trap, and for a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, verse 15, and many among them shall stumble and fall and be broken and be snared and be taken. Jesus was a test. Jesus was a test to see if you was a middleman worshiper or a true, authentic God worshiper. Jesus was a test. That's all he was. Okay? And this test was to prove and separate all those who are the true worshipers of God. Jesus even tried to tell you to worship God. He told you only to worship God, the one and only true God. He told you to only fear him that can destroy both the soul and the body. Even Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your heart all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength, which is what the Torah has already told us. But what's our problem? Our problem is we want to love two masters. We want to serve two masters. You can't love Jesus as God and God the Father at the same time. God is jealous, and you're serving two masters in Christianity. That's exactly what you're doing. Okay, you're going to have to make a choice this day. Are you going to associate partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Or are you going to worship him with no partners? Assalamu alaikum to my brothers and sisters in the real truth.